Well, hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Gospel Eschatology. I'm Mike Sullivan, your host, and I have a very special guest, Gary DeMar. He's uh, kind of one of my eschatological heroes. He's he's probably the one that I, I look to the most whenever I'm looking in another book to substantiate something on Matthew 24. I've, I've always found Gary and uh, John L. Bray uh, of which Gary publishes in American Vision, his his commentary, probably the the best researched material I have found on the Olivet Discourse and some other really key passages. And Gary, you've written what thirty? Most of my audience knows you, um, so I don't don't feel a need to go into you know all your background. But you've got about what thirty five books? Yeah, thirty. 30- 35 published books, uh, of course, not all on eschatology. And I've got a, a, a bunch more that I've, they're in various stages of completion that I'm, that I'm working on. Yes. And I like the fact that it's not all eschatology because the more I look at how fascism is invading, global fascism is invading our culture, the more relevant I see your comment, you know, that there is no neutrality. <laughs> I mean, I, I you almost wish there was, but I I just am having a hard time seeing it at this point. Well, I, I always tell people that the the main reason I got into eschatology, I, I actually when I was in seminary, I mean back in the 1970s, I became a Christian in 1973. Uh, late Great Planet Earth was a big big deal, and uh, and so that was kind of the thing that everyone was talking about. I was just dissatisfied with what I was reading. I didn't know enough about the Bible to criticize it. I just had, I had questions that, that, uh, those types of books weren't answering. So I always tell people I'm a worldview guy. I want to know how the Bible applies to every area of life. And then I wrote a series of books in the eighties called God and government, uh, originally three volumes. And now it's a single volume that American vision, uh, publishes. And I would go out on the road and start, you know, addressing the topic of government. Now, my book isn't, it's not God and politics, it's called God and government. And, you know, self-government, family government, church government, and civil government, which is the political side of things, and that God was the governor of all things. And inevitably, someone would come along and say, why are we talking about all of this stuff because Jesus is coming back soon. So this was so this was the 1980s. So you think think about that it was 40 40 years ago. And so for 40 years and, and even today, people you know Jesus is coming back soon. Why are we bothering with the things that you're talking about? In fact, what you're talking about, Mike, is they would see that as a prophetic inevitability, and that there's nothing you can do about it because it's all the signs of the end you know, of, of, of the last days. Yes. Uh, and but so if your eschatology is, you know, Jesus is coming soon. The rapture is right around the corner. Uh, you know, we're, we're the we're the rapture generation and so forth. The stuff you're talking about only reinforces their view of eschatology. And so that's why I got involved in this was to kind of I, I didn't get into it to refute the prominent eschatology. I got into it to examine it, examine it, and, and in my examination of it, I began to see it's got all kinds of problems. Yeah, and that, that kind of is a good segue into what our topic is today. And um, after my interview with you, I'll be interviewing Alex Newman. And as you know, I mean, you actually had an interview with Alex Newman, but his boss <laughs> kind of kind of squashed it because of of uh what I would call probably the golden calf of premillennial dispensationalism and that is 1 Thessalonians 4 16 and 17 and you know why polish brass on a sinking ship because all of this has been foretold we want a war in the middle east because they think that's armageddon they think that's gog and magog and more importantly it's because they want to be raptured. So they're willing to self-fulfill prophecies that have already been fulfilled, drag us into war because they think 1 Thessalonians 4 is talking about them f- flying off of the earth. And so we, we have a problem in dispensationalism politically, 
but we also have a problem with this passage in Reformed theology, which is yeah, and, yeah, and it's important to 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 recognize you know this wasn't the first time that I was kind of cut off in terms of eschatology. I was this was this was years ago. I was invited to speak, uh, come on a a, a broadcast of a, a, a that was a it was an on lot it was on air live television show back in Kansas City. And uh, the associate producer <clears throat> invited me to come on and I on to talk about eschatology. I said, "Now, are you sure about this?" She says, "Oh yeah, no problem." No problem. <laughs> and so I get there, and then the host of the show, hostess of the show, came on, came in, and said, "Now, what are we talking about today?" And she said, "Oh, we're going to talk about eschatology." And she said, "Absolutely not." And uh, so we we had to I had to completely shift gears and providentially worked out pretty well because we talked about God and government. I sold a lot of God God and government books. <laughs> um, and so you know th th it is this is kind of a sacred cow. Uh, um, almost everywhere you go. In fact, I'll give you another example. I was I was invited by um, conservative conservative women of America, which was Beverly LaHaye's organization, to speak. If you can believe that. Wow. And. Uh, so I, it was a big, big conference I was supposed to speak at. And, uh, of course, once, I guess, Tim LaHaye said, there's no way in the world we're going to have Gary DeMar speak at this conference. Even though the stuff that I was saying on government and the things that he was saying about America's Christian heritage, we would we agreed on. Uh, but this this happens over and over and over again uh, because there's there's so much. There's so much ministry support. There's so much money support. Mm -hmm. uh, people have to protect their, um, their 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 ministries. A good example is Hank Hanegraaff. Hank Hanegraaff changed his uh, eschatological position, and he he told me that he, I think he lost like a million dollars in funding in one year as a result of that. Wow! But this yeah. is a this is a big big deal, uh, and it's also dangerous. I have an article up today. This is. I don't know if this is live, but probably be shown later on as well. October, October third, um, two thousand twenty-four, up on American American Visions uh, site, AmericanVision.org, and I, I I deal with this uh, with you know, Israel. We're, we're living in the last days. Uh, God's going to deal with Israel again. Uh, Israel is the apple of God's eye, and all this and so forth. And I and I wrote, wait, oh, wait, hold on here a second, because according to the According to the dispensationalists, two thirds of the Jews living in Israel are going to be slaughtered during the time that God supposedly, after two thousand years, is going to is going to renew His covenant with Israel. And after this two thousand years, He's going to renew His covenant with one single end time generation of of, of of Israelites living in the Promised Land, and then He's going to allow the Antichrist to take over the world so that two thirds of the Jews living in Israel are going to be slaughtered. Yeah. And we don't, you know, and, and by the way, you'll see in the, in the article that all the, all the dispensationalists that I quote that hold that position, but the general, the general public isn't hearing that all they're hearing about is how God's going to deal with Israel again. God loves Israel. Uh, and um, will be raptured out before all hell breaks loose and so forth. So this this position really, really needs uh, to be examined. And all Christians out there, you need to take a, a special second look at this perspective by allowing the Bible to speak for itself. Amen. Amen. Uh, modern Israel is not a fulfillment of any prophecy, Old Testament or New Testament. And, uh, you know, usually that gets down to Romans 11 when it's all said and done. But today we're going to be focusing in on a golden calf because I was watching, you know, I, I had listened to your your interview and your show with Rick Welch and, you know, the big question at the end there that started all this. But I don't really place that there. I really place the beginning of this when you posted simply. Honestly, just a question. You posted a chart by G.K. Beale showing the parallels between Matthew 24 and 1 Thessalonians 4. Yeah. And it just, I mean, the amount of comments that that circulated and just like, Gary, you're not allowed to do this. If you're an amillennialist, Gary, 
you're allowed to make these parallels and talk about it. But you can't, as a partial preterist, even remotely bring this chart up. And the, fun, and the funny thing about this, this, this is anybody who's involved in debating subjects, not just eschatology. But one of the best ways to deal with an, oppos with an oppositional view is to find people who generally don't agree with you on some things. Like you have, you have of course, Mike Sullivan is the master of charts, of or especially of parallel charts, and they're all very good. But and, and sometimes I, I, I do use them. But if I'm going to get in a debate with somebody who is a dispensationalist and somebody who respects somebody like G.K. Beale, if I can find something that G.K. Beale has done uh, that is contradictory to the, the prevailing opinion, that's that's the thing I'm going to do. And so it was a, it was essentially a safe bet for me to. to and by the way. I got, I got that chart. I just give Mike the credit here that it was. I had seen it. I think someplace that Mike had it, and I, I, I yeah, put it and, up. And house in uh, and, and house divided. We, uh, you know, I made, right. yeah. I made. I I I follow the same apologetic that you do. Like I'm not going to make my own chart. I'm going to let my opponents make the chart. So <laughs> I just all I did was copy this this chart. I I got it. Uh, I even got permission from IVP to use it. I think I had to pay some money actually to, to do it. But anyway, um, let's look at this chart, which caused just the the firestorm. First, let me read what Bill says. <clears throat> let me read the passage first. We declare to you by the word from the Lord. Now, commentators are, are divided on this. Is he referring to the Old Testament word, the Lord, or is he referring to Christ? Um, of course, Jesus and Paul are using the same Old Testament passages. No one denies that. But I think it's really clear that he's following Jesus' teaching in the Olivet Discourse. Now, listen to what, what he says. He says, Bill writes, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 through 17, describe generally the same end time scenario as chapter 5. Specifically, Paul narrates the resurrection at the end of the age and then recapitulates it in chapter 5 by speaking about the timing of this event and about the judgment on unbelievers which will happen at the same time now here it is that both first thessalonians 4 and chapter 5 explain the same events is discernible from observing that both passages actually form one continuous depiction of the same narrative in matthew 24 as apparent from the chart and now this is the chart and you know, Gary, what I like to do is just kind of break this down a little bit logically. And the classic all millennial view and what Beale is presenting here is that since A, Matthew 24, is equal to B, well, then both A and B are future. But then the partial preterist comes along and says, now, wait a second, but A was fulfilled in AD 70. And then the full preterist says, well, I believe in reformed and always reforming. I believe you're both right. So if A equals B and A was fulfilled in AD 70, Matthew 24, well, then so was B. And if not, why not? And, yeah, and, and, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I, I'll let you go ahead. And, and here are those parallels that just these parallels, Gary, I believe, just really unravel some of the, um, the biases or preconceived notions from the pre-trib rapturist like. Chuck Smith, if he was alive, he would hate this chart. John MacArthur hates this chart. And you found out <clears throat> that partial preterists really hate this chart because it, it shows that there's one coming of Christ and that Paul is getting his eschatology from Jesus so that there's not, this, there's not two comings separated by seven years and there's not two comings separated from, you know, between 80, 70 and at the end of world history coming. And I think this chart poses a problem for both of those positions. And, and I, here's the thing, you know, it's what, what comes, what comes first in this argument. And I think what comes first in this argument is the amount of material that is given to us where there's a great deal of agreement on as the, the, those events were fulfilled in the lead up to and including the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. And that is 
Matthew, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 17, Luke 19, and Luke 21. That is the preponderance of, of, of prophetic material that we have. And that is prior to what we're reading in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And so, and we've got all these partial preterist critics, you know, Ken Gentry, you know, for example, being the probably the most prominent one today, because he has he's made this kind of a career choice for him on attacking the full preterist position. And we see some of his backing away from that with what he does in Matthew chapter 24, where uh, 27. the end of the age is something that's still distant future. Then he changed his view on Matthew 24, 27, because the word parousia is used there. And on, of course, in, in verse 37, he parousia is used. So he, and we know that he splits, he splits Matthew 20, uh, 24, 35, 30, 35, and 36. So you got all you have all of these these commentators going back centuries who are very clear that look, this is Jesus is describing events leading up to and including the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. And then a book that American Vision republished um, by Nehemiah Nisbet uh, and uh, on the destruction of Jerusalem, which American Vision publishes published a year or so ago. He has a really fairly lengthy commentary on 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And he says, that's that's AD 70. That's the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. So you've got all this, you have all this evidence. Before you even look at this chart, if you just had partial preterists out there looking at looking at all of this material that for for, for decades saw this material as, repl- as as applying to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. Then Beale comes along and says, who is not even a partial preterist, uh, although he makes he tips his hat to some of it sometimes. Right. Uh, and he comes up with this chart linking the two. And, and Beale is a very, very respected commentator. Yes, he is. Then you you've got you've got some questions to to answer here and have and have to deal with it. You can disagree with Beale on this. I'm okay with that. Uh, but I mean, Beale's hard to disagree with, and I think I think he's he's, he's on the money uh, with all of this. And look there, and as we'll discuss, and you'll probably you'll bring up as well. There's there some of the language is a little different and so forth, and that has to be dealt with. But according to Beale, he knows what that language is. It fits with a parallel with with Matthew chapter twenty four and twenty five. It sure does. I mean, look at all. I mean, it's it's almost as if. Paul has the Olivet Discourse right in front of him because he almost follows it in chronological order. There's only a couple places in here that are not in chronological order. Um, it's the same trumpet. It's the same coming. He uses a different word. You know, Jesus does gather. Paul does catch away. But Paul also uses gather in other places in Thessalonians. And it's a hard sell to say that that coming is a different coming than 1 Thessalonians 4 that we'll get to here in a minute. But, you know, when it came to number eight, Gary, he comes like a thief. That is what turned me to be a full preterist. And I didn't even know that was a view at the time. But <clears throat> I was I was studying, I was taking a correspondence course uh, with Dr. Bonson on Revelation. You know, I had his cassette tapes and I had to do all these assignments. Well, I was in... Well, was it Revelation 2 or 3 uh, addressing Christ coming as a thief? And I was like, okay. And I was looking at 1 Thessalonians 5. I was looking at 2 Peter 3, Christ comes as a thief. And I'd already had problems dividing all the Olivet Discourse into two comings. Everything I was reading from Gentry, <clears throat> um, Marcellus Kick, they always divided it. And they really wouldn't do any exegesis beyond verse 35 and 36. And that that troubled me that that was something that was in the back of my head i don't know about that um and so i opened up days of vengeance and i said okay wh- what does chilton say about christ coming as a thief in matthew 24 43 because this is supposed to be the end of the world history uh second section right and i read it in there and sure enough he took matthew 24 43 as 87 and i'm like wait a- he's not allowed to do that He's not allowed to do that. And I, and that's what caused this whole thing because I made my own chart 
Uh, I just come out of dispensationalism. I liked my all millennialism. Everything was really simple. One coming of Christ, end of the age. And then I got reading your stuff. And I'm like, this even makes more sense. This generation time text, letting the Bible interpret itself. But I started floating back a little bit to my all millennialism because I was I was making this chart for myself. I, no one had made it for me. And it was almost verbatim of what Beale came up with. And I'm like, if Chilton is saying that Christ coming as a thief in the Olivet Discourse was fulfilled in AD 70. That means that there's only one coming of Christ in Matthew 24 and 25. And that was fulfilled in AD 70. And if that's the case, I don't see how in the world First Thessalonians 4 and 5 was not fulfilled in AD 70. Did I have if, all the yeah. answers? No, but you could see the construction of it. And yeah, you mentioned uh, Revelation 2 and 3. And if you look at that, there are I think there are at least two. I think there are three times Jesus threatens to come to those local churches at that particular period of time which is an, an indicator that just because there is a coming mentioned in scripture, it is not a physical end time coming uh, because those particular comings in, in, in Revelation 2 and 3 were obviously uh, comings in terms of uh, ma making a, a judic judicial and ethical assessment of what was taking place in those churches. And if you pick up you know, commentaries that, that aren't preterist at all, m most of them, in fact, acknowledge that. Uh, and I think the only one I was able to find, and I haven't looked at all the commentaries by dispensationalists on this, but Robert Thomas tries to make a case that those things are actually second coming passages, which I just think is just absolutely ridiculous. Uh, so the, one, of the, one of the first things you, you have to do in doing stuff like this is, uh, not feel like if you don't completely get everything that's being said there, that you have to give in to a, um, a, a kind of majority interpretation of it all. I, I can't figure all this out. So these guys are smarter than I am and therefore they, they must be right. And so I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to stick with that. And that, that's a, that's a comfortable position. I mean, I, you know, I, I like to look at what commentators have to say. It makes, you know, I'm, I'm looking for, you know, what are they, what are, what are their arguments to either refute what I'm saying or to support what I'm saying and, and the refutation, how does it stand up? And it's, that, that's what you have to do. Uh, but unfortunately today, there, there are certain, uh, just like the dispensationalists have their sacred cows. Uh, you, you will find reform folk and others who also have their, their sacred cows. And of course the reform folk will say, Oh, we agree with this particular sacred cow of the, the dispensationalists about these, the, these final coming uh, passages. Um, and which is kind of interesting in and, in and of itself, the hermeneutic of the dispensationalists is so off that one would make you think that, you know, possibly, Hey, maybe this this maybe this has crept in to other aspects of eschatology that we believe and that the church has believed for for all these years, and that's kind of. And I've been asking these questions for you know more than twenty five years, right. um, and it, it's it's hard to you know come out and ask these questions publicly because you 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 know what kind of what kind of a t uh, response you're going to get, which I, I got for the last for the last year. Um, and so it's well, <clears throat> let me give you an example of what you just said and, and why I respect you so much and our friendship in Christ. And that is <clears throat> something that's in this book that you published by Jordan. And uh, it's a good segue right here. You know, you you weren't buying the consensus of of what people were saying on Matthew 24, 31 in this eschatological gathering. Now, now Beale says that the gathering here is referring to the resurrection, both of the living and the dead. He, he puts that. And then of course the Reformation study Bible says the language of Matt, the gathering Christ coming upon the clouds is parallel to messages, passages like Matthew 13, 41, 
uh, chapter 16, 27, Matthew 25, 31. Now, these are passages that the editors took as AD 70, but this particular all-millennialist who is a part of the Reformation Study Bible, obviously he says that 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians are parallel passages to the resurrection. Now, uh, in this book and in your debate with Dr. Michael Brown, you took that that eschatological gathering there. Now, most partial predators say, well, this is a post AD 70 uh, evangelism where the angels are, you know, just Christians and we're gathering people into the kingdom as they receive Christ. That concept, I agree with that concept. I just don't believe that text is teaching that concept. And you came along and Jordan came along and said, wait a second, we might need to rethink this passage on the gathering. Tell us what happened in your debate, because I don't think Dr. Brown expected you to say what you said on the gathering there. Well, I, I, the, the, the first thing I would say is, is that R.T. France, you know, he that was when I, when I started, I went back and looked at my first edition of Last Day's Madness, which I think I did in 19 back in the night, late, late, late 1980s, maybe early 1990s, uh, France had written a, a, I think it was a doctoral dissertation, and it was very, very good. People still quote it today, uh, that that gathering there was, uh, he took the word angelos and said that those were, um, uh, which just simply means messenger. John the Baptist is a messenger. He's, a, he's an angelos, he's an angel, messenger. He took the position that these were just, you know, these were just Christian messengers taking the gospel out, and it it makes it makes you know sense that that's the case. He has since gone, he's since changed his position a little bit, and he says that there the angels are actually involved in this ministerial gathering, which I thought was rather interesting that he would take that position. He doesn't really expand on it that much, and uh, you know. Jim Jim Jordan is a um, longtime friend and has a very literary mind. And anytime I got stuck on a passage, I would always go to Jim on, on this. And uh, it, it, most interpreters, and I took it that way as well, that the the um, what's 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 the, uh, the the language that's used there it doesn't say the four corners of the earth, four corners of heaven, four corners of yeah, four corners of heaven, and. Uh, Jim saw that as, you know, dealing not with evangelism per se, uh, but it was a, he doesn't quite say it, but it's as if he was talking about what he deals with in his Daniel commentary, Daniel chapter 12, yeah. dealing with the old, old covenant. What, what do you do with those old covenant saints? Um, and the martyrs, yes. Yeah. What 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 do you do? What what happens to them? What what was going to happen to them since the time of Christ? Were they, you know, were they just completely lost? Which I I believe, and I was talking to Kim Burgess yesterday about about this. Is that that was really the issue in first in First Corinthians chapter fifteen? Uh, and so, you know, I can't remember just exactly, but I had a couple of debates with Doctor Brown. So this must have been the radio debate with him, but. I, this, I think was was, second, this was the second one, I believe, on, yeah. on the Olivet Discourse. Yeah, and it, I think the con the concept is so foreign to people that they just can't figure it. Out. They just can't figure it into their 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 hermeneutic. It's it's just hardly anybody ever talks about what happened to those old covenant saints. They 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 had died. Where were they? You know when they died what was their status at that particular period of time that's a, that's a huge question and that was something that i was trying to get across to dr brown uh, was something that i had borrowed essentially from from jim jordan and it's it's a it's a valid and necessary question that has to be asked and is that something paul that's something that jesus was talking talking about there and is it something that that paul is talking about in first thessalonians 4 and then also in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. These, these are all legitimate questions that have to be asked. And by the way, orthodoxy isn't on the table here with this. I mean, let's let, let's get honest here. This is what is being discussed here. This is so we're talking about the resurrection, the resurrection of the dead. 
what what does that what does that mean? And you know, Paul was on the re- was on trial for the resurrection of the dead and for the hope of Israel. What what does that mean in terms of biblical theology today? Amen. Amen. Now, notice that um, uh, Beal, he, he actually, in another work, he says, it is, he's backtracked on the, on the coming of Christ in Matthew 24, 30. He says, it is likely better to see Matthew 24, 30 fulfilled not at the very end of history, but rather in AD 70 at the destruction of Jerusalem in which the Son of Man's coming would would be understood as an invisible coming in yeah. judgment using the Roman armies. And now he says this creates a thorny problem, right? Because he in his commentary, he says that's the same coming that produces the resurrection. So he realizes this is a thorny problem. Like, well, which passage is the end of the world history passage and which one is possibly Christ coming in AD 70? And he says, well, it needs more study. Well, we've done the more study. I've given him house divided. I've given him my exegesis of First Thessalonians 4. Prove me wrong if I haven't done the study. But this is how, uh, Gary, he feels his way out is. He says, Matthew 25, 31 clearly is applied to the very end of the age, Matthew 24, 30, um, at Christ's final coming. But Gary is, the, well, that didn't come down very well, but... Is this really clear? Is Matthew 25, 31 clear in Reformed eschatology that that is the end of world history coming? Because oh, that, yeah, that's that, that's good. That's a good question. I want to, a couple of a couple of things. If, if we ever if we did a kind of the man in the street interview with um, uh, let's say dispensationalists and so forth, and that the first quotation that you had up there with with, with Beal. And you had a multiple choice uh, answer here. Who who said this? And you put three three preterists in, and then you put uh, Beal in, and invariably everybody would would choose one of the other three, and would never never choose Beal on it. Uh, and again, so Beal here's Beal again. He's he 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 sees. Look, every commentator sees all of this. Yes. You, all, you just have to read the commentators to know they see this as a thorny, thorny problem. They, they, they all do. Uh, and then my, the, the, the other thing is, is I have a, my 11 year old granddaughter was listening to a couple of messages on uh, Mark chapter 13. And um, she, she came up to me and, and asked, she said, Papa, which, which ones apply to AD? Which ones apply to AD 70 and which ones apply to yet in the future? So she, she saw it and yeah. she couldn't reconcile what she was hearing with what her father and I, 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 I don't really sit down with my ch- grandchildren and just go through all this with them. But, you know, they talk about these things at home. How do you how do you make how do you make the division between these two? John Murray is another one, prominent reformed theologian. Uh, he, he, he looks at Matthew chapter 24 and he says, oh, some of these things apply to AD 70 and some of these things apply to what we would call the, you know, the, the, the second coming of Christ. But there is, there is nothing that I saw in anything that he said that you could tell where, where the dividing line was, it was in, in all of this. Uh, so I, this, is a, this is, again, everybody knows this is an issue and everybody knows that their, their paradigm is disturbed by this, and so they essentially take a dualistic way of understanding things and, and, just, and, and are willing to live with it. They are willing to live with the dualism. Yeah. I think that's, you know, that's, that's where we are today. Um, and then, you know, back to um, Matthew 25, 31. Yeah. Um, and what is, the, what is the name of the book that uh, Matthewson edited? It's it's um, right here on the screen. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay from yeah, from okay. age to age, the unfolding yeah, of biblical. There, yeah, there, yeah. Okay. I see. Yeah. Age to age. Okay. And uh, and but okay. But that's the book that he the, the the book that he edited dealing with full preterism that you guys responded to. What was? When shall uh, these things be? Yeah. Okay. So you have Matheson, 
who comes out and comes out with a book. He's the editor of it, <laughs> criticizing the full full preterist arguments. And uh, as you know, that I've noted, I've I've looked at all of these guys that signed that that three questions letter of mine. <laughs> I, I I well. You know, Doug Wilson says this, but he, he and he and Ken Gentry disagree here. Bill Kaiser says this, and Kaiser disagrees with them here. And all of these guys can't agree among themselves. And so here you have Keith Matheson, who doesn't agree with the guys who are, are critical of full preterism by because he says that Matthew 24, 31 is actually re- refers to events leading up to and including the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. And, you know, people's heads spin when you point all this out to them. And so, you know, their their answer to this is, well, the creeds have dealt with this. The confessions have, have dealt with it. So this is what the church has always believed. And so let's let's move on. And I, 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 I can't live with attention. I, I, I couldn't live with the with attention. So I asked these questions. And I got blasted and I'm, you know, deplatformed and all kinds of things. And uh, I don't think I've lost friendships over it, but uh, uh, I don't get the kind of calls I used to get on like Saturday night from by, by Jeff Durbin. That he was preaching the next day on Matthew 24 and said, Gary, can you help me with this passage? And I, I have this extensive outline on Matthew 24 and I sent I sent it to him and uh, I don't get those kinds of calls anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll be uh, discussing Doug and Mr. Durbin on the end of the age here shortly. But notice how uh, Keith is is taking Matthew twenty five thirty one as the ascension in AD seventy. So let's let's think about this. So so Beale is saying, okay, I'm willing to surrender Matthew twenty four thirty in spite of what I said in my commentary on First Second Thessalonians. <laughs> Um, it's a thorny problem, sure, but I'm going to run to, to Matthew 25, 31 as my safe haven. Matheson comes along, takes that away from Bill. Nah, that's AD 72. But here's the problem I'm seeing. This, this is the fulfillment of Daniel 7, 13. So uh, there's only one coming of the Son of Man upon the clouds in that passage. And Jesus is citing that here in Matthew 24, 30. Uh, Matthew 25, 31, and then John in Revelation 1, uh, 7. And so, Gary, I'm looking at the passage and I'm like, it, it's complete in my mind, okay, in my mind. It's, com- it's complete eisegesis to read into Daniel 7, 13, three different comings of the Son of Man on the clouds. First, it's his going into a physical cloud, the ascension. Then it's his coming in an invisible cloud, in AD 70, and then it's him coming a third time on a physical cloud, physically at the end of world history. I'm looking at Daniel 7, 13, and I'm like, and I'm connecting it to Daniel 9, Daniel 12, and there's one appointed time of the end when the Son of Man comes, when the books are opened. And I'm not I'm not seeing that as three different cloud comings of Christ. And, and I think this is what futurism is forced to do, uh, to do a lot of uh, reading into the text of things that just aren't there. Yeah, and, and, the, uh, and add to this, you've got Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. Yes. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the land will mourn over him, even so, amen. And so here's, here's this, which com- what coming is this? <laughs> and so Gentry in his commentary on Revelation, and I, look, I would tell people, you know, if you want a really good commentary on Revelation, Ken Gentry's is pretty good. You just have to just, you know, kind of me- meander around some of his, his, Qual- his capitulation on things and so change of mind and so forth. But he spends 20, 22 pages defending uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 7 as a reference to not this the this other coming of Christ at the end of history. He says this is this is a reference to events leading up to and including the destructions of, of Jerusalem in AD seventy. Exactly. And it's it's really hard for me to wrap my head around all of this uh, because I, I, I would I would I, of course I'm not that I'm not that smart, but I I wouldn't know how to come up with these these different comings and be able to determine where 
where the knife should come down on right. in a particular verse telling me that this is a different coming from that coming, even though the same language is being used. Um, and yeah. so one of the arguments they use is, well, we find this language used in the Old Testament. And we appropriate that language from the Old Testament, you know, something like uh, Isaiah chapter 19, Isaiah chapter 13 for sun, moon and star stuff. And you say, see, we see that. But each one of those is actually designated as a, in a particular historical context. You know, Rev, uh, Isaiah chapter 13 is specifically against Babylon. And you know that Rev, uh, Isaiah chapter 19 is dealing with Egypt. So there you are given a time element as well as a particular entity that this is addressed to, but you don't find that in the New Testament. They're just kind of thrown in there, and then someone has to come along and say, oh, this has to refer to the, the, uh, the second coming, because if it doesn't refer to the second coming, then it refers to AD 70, and that's one less verse we have in order to prove <laughs> this, this, that I'm the center of the universe and that I'm going to be raptured off the planet. Yeah. Soon. Well, again, you know, people like you know Gentry and those don't believe in a rapture. Oh yeah. yeah. Uh, but they 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 still they're have looking, they're, they're, they need to hold on to some future coming passages to fit into those creeds. Yeah. And and, and look, my, my position is pr is pretty simple. Uh, I ask questions about these things. I don't like the answers I've gotten for a very very long period of time. Does that mean I've got each all of these figured out and can, can tell you in detail how each one of these verses uh, definitively apply to that particular period of time? No, I, I can't in, in some cases. Some of them, I'm, it's, it's no problem at all. Uh, but I, I'm constrained to put it within the context of what I, uh, what I think the time element is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and its similarities to what Beale says connected to Matthew 24 and, 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 uh, and, and Nisbet as well, Matthew 24 and 25. Uh, what, what, am I, what am I supposed to do with all of this? And the, these people are seeing the parallels. Absolutely. And if it's okay for them to see the parallels, why isn't it okay for me to see the parallels? And I guess it's because I'm coming to different conclusions than they are on all of this. Yes. And that's so, threatening. Yeah, exactly. So Bill says, it's okay. This is a thorny problem. But... Matthew 25, 31 definitely is the end of world history, and it's connected to the end of the age of Matthew 24, 3. Well, this is a problem, again, because Matheson, who is Doug Wilson's editor in When Shall These Things Be, says, no, Matthew 25, 31 was AD 70. Well, I contacted Mr. Wilson. I said, well, Doug, you know, uh, you take end of the age in Matthew 24, 3 as the old covenant age. Where is your division in the Olivet Discourse, or do you have one? And he says, well, I definitely would divide it at Matthew 25, 31. And I said, you do know that your editor, <laughs> Keith Matheson, doesn't. He says, that's AD 70. Of course, I got no response. Uh, but this is a problem, too, because I've debated Michael Brown on 1 Corinthians 13, the gifts. You've debated him a, a couple of times. Doug has debated him uh, on the gifts, and I found it, and, and Michael is learning. He's learning, and he's learning, I think, to use full preterist arguments against some of the partial preterists. So in that debate, Doug said the gifts ended, the revelatory gifts and the sign gifts ended at the end of the Old Covenant age, and he went to Matthew 24, 3. Michael said, now, wait a second, Doug, you can't do that because that's the resurrection. And he went to Matthew 13, the parable of the wheat and the tares. At the end of the age, the righteous will shine in the resurrection of Daniel 12. Now, Doug doesn't want to talk about Daniel 12 at all, any way, shape, or form, okay? Um, he's just, he's a no-show. And Doug had no argument there because clearly in Matthew, Matthew 13, the end of the age you take that as the old covenant age that's the resurrection of daniel 12 and doug sees the train coming and he just he he in my he his position was accurate the gifts did end in 80 70 but he doesn't because he's inconsistent he can't build the exegetical case in my opinion and this and this is interesting you you, you bring you bring this up um about others other people have spotted the the, the problem with this and I 
a good friend of mine, uh, Jonathan Sedlak, has written this definitive book on uh, the new heavens and new earth. He's kind of a historical study of all this, and he's been continuing to work on it. And he said one of the, just one of the things that got him into preterism was reading John MacArthur's book, uh, the, the Second Coming, uh, and he had seen my name in in that. And he said, "Well, if John MacArthur is quoting some, you know, some guy named Gary Demar, then Gary Demar must be somebody significant." So he started reading my stuff, and then he became a, a, a preterist. Um, and so I went back, and I had written an article, and, re, and it was a review of MacArthur's book on Second Coming. And I got blasted by um, what's his name, uh, Phil Phil Johnson. Not oh, Philip yeah. Johnson, but Phil Johnson, because yeah, I think I, Phil I'm Johnson actually him. edited the book, and it was a sloppy, it was a sloppy edit job. But one right. of the interesting things is uh, that MacArthur comments on my use of Matthew uh, twenty-four and dealing with the uh, sun, moon, and stars language, and he also quotes Ken Gentry. But in a lengthy footnote or endnote in the book, he says if if Gentry is taking the sun, moon, and stars language in Matthew chapter 24 as applying to AD 70, then it seems to me, MacArthur writes, or Phil Johnson or whomever, that he should be doing the same thing with Second Peter chapter 3, mm-hmm. which I thought was a pretty good insight. You know, yeah. if, if it's if it's true in this case, why isn't it true in the case of Second Peter chapter 3, exactly. which, by the way, John Lightfoot takes as Lee is dealing with AD 70. And exactly. so there all of this, all of this inconsistency out there. Ha, ha, I think these guys, these guys need to come clean with it uh, because there's there's no agreement with them except for creedal agreement and confessional agreement, but not exegetical agreement. And I'm looking for exegetical agreement. Show your work. If you can't show your work. Don't come to me <laughs> and and call me a heretic. And and they refuse to show their exegetical work. Let's um, I, I kind of like this chart here, um, because these are passages that partial preterists, um, and Doug is kind of uncommitted on Matthew sixteen twenty seven. I, I thought he was, but uh, there's a reason why he's not committed on on certain passages. But clearly, you can see. This is the same coming of Christ between Matthew 16, Matthew 24, and Matthew 25. Same Greek words, Erkamai, he comes with angels, he comes in glory, he comes in power, he comes in judgment to reward and to repay in all three passages. And Christ and his kingdom come at the same time. And Gary, Matthew 25 to me is just simply recapitulation. It's in the Jewish hermeneutical world, they used a lot of recapitulation, just like the book of Revelation is recapitulation. Ezekiel is recapitulation. Um, you know, so is the Olivet Discourse. When we look at Mark's account, Mark 13 and Luke 21, Luke's account of the Olivet Discourse, we only have one coming of the Son of Man. We don't have two or four mentions of the coming of the Son of Man like we do in the Olivet Discourse, which to me screams out. I've got a Jewish audience here, so I'm going to use recapitulation. I'm going to refer to the abomination of desolation according to Daniel because I have a Jewish audience. Mark and Luke don't have to describe it that way. Luke's going to describe it as the army surrounding Jerusalem. So we have different audiences, different styles of teaching and communicating the Olivet Discourse. And you've done a masterful job, I think, in Last Day's Madness of showing better than any even full preterists. That's why I quoted you in my in my book, um, in showing that there are not two comings in the in the Olivet Discourse. Matthew 25, 31 is the same coming as Matthew 24, 30. And I and I held on to that, you know, this that division because it was Marcellus Kick. Right. Uh, and I when I when I first that was my first introduction to preterism was Marcellus Kick's book, Kick's book on Matthew 24, which was originally written in 1948. Uh, but over time, I just couldn't couldn't hold on to it. And what you mentioned, Matthew sixteen twenty seven through twenty eight. I have a I have a new book coming out. It's actually a uh, I'm reissuing the book, but I've just put a whole lot more material in it uh, called Prophecy Wars. I have a chapter in there on Matthew sixteen twenty seven and twenty eight, 
and where I'm responding to Ken Gentry. Ken Gentry takes Matthew 16, 27 as the second coming. That's crazy. And Matthew 16, uh, 28 as AD 70. Now you would think that they would have been flipped, that Jesus would have talked about AD 70 first, and then he would have talked about the second coming. But Ken says, no, it's the, you know, verse 27 is the second coming. And the thing is the word mellow is used in 16, 27. And it's the first, it's, it's the antecedent. It's right. It's right at the beginning of the chapter is I, I'm about to come. And, uh, and, and Ken tried to make the point that there are all these commentators agree with him that Matthew 16, 27 refers to, um, uh, the second, the second coming. So I thought, okay, so I checked some other commentators and guess what? There are a whole bunch of commentators who, who argue that it refers to AD 70. So once again, there's no agreement among commentators uh, on this. And so what, what, what do you do? You can't, you can't now use Matthew 16, 27, 16, 27 as a passage that supports the second coming that now, and if anybody's a heretic who does, they've got all these heretics out there who really who, who aren't heretics. They're just saying, "Hey, the text. This is what the text says, and this is this is mine. This is the interpretation of it." So it, it's 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 all there, uh, and I think that it's Mike. I it's interesting that the whole this whole debate has quieted down significantly. I don't know if you you can tell, but I can tell. Uh, there's, you can may still be writing. I think he's going to be working on Matthew 24, 25. I look forward to it. It'd be interesting to see how he deals deals with a lot of these texts. Yeah, uh, but uh, most they're they're not talking about it anymore because I know that because I think they know they've got themselves in a trap. They're they're stuck. Yeah, they are. Uh, and the more they come out and talk against it, exactly. People say, well, what about this and what about that and what about this. And so the best thing to do is just be quiet and don't say anything about it. But Ken, Ken can't do this. And I love Ken. I mean, we've known one another for years, going all the way back to seminary days. Uh, I just, you know, I he 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 put his put his stake in the ground on the on on, on the defeating the whole full preterist argument. I never took a position on it because I was I don't want to say he wasn't honest. I was honest enough to, to myself to say. I, I don't know. I'm going to have to continue to investigate this. Right. Exactly. And, you know, and there's there's nothing wrong with that. And and we'll look at maybe some of the hypocrisy here uh, from those who signed the letter, especially when we get into First Thessalonians 4. But Keith Matheson also takes Second Thessalonians 1, 5 through 10 as fulfilled in 87. He says, there are several pieces of evidence that indicate a fulfillment of 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. Those who are in fact afflicting them are Jews, Acts 17, whom Jesus explicitly declared would be judged within one generation of his death. Uh, there is a distinct parallel. Now, see, he, he doesn't mind doing parallels, but, uh, but when we do parallels between Matthew 24 and 1 Thessalonians 4, they're just not allowed. There's a distinct parallel between the language of 2 Thessalonians 1 and Matthew 16, 27, 28, which you were talking about, which describes a coming of the Son of Man for judgment within the lifetime of some of his disciples. On the basis of this evidence, we conclude that the coming of Christ for judgment in 2 Thessalonians 1 is the same as the coming of Christ for judgment revealed in the Olivet Discourse and elsewhere. And so here's the question, Gary, look at this chart. These are the passages that Keith Matheson says were fulfilled in AD 70. Matthew 16, 27, 28, Matthew 24 and 25, and Luke 17, when he's revealed from heaven, then the kingdom of God is going to be within. You're not going to be able to say, see here or there. Now look at the parallels between uh, these passages on, on my left. And, and then on the other side of this chart, the other end, he takes 2 Thessalonians 1, 5 through 10 is 80, 70. But in all, all three of these, Christ comes, Erkamai or Parousia. Uh, he comes from heaven or on the clouds in all three. He comes with angels in all three. And the kingdom is realized either in or within, or the saints are glorified within. He comes and he glorifies his saints within them. 
So it's hard to look at these passages and say, well, one's, one is sticks out as the end of world history when I don't know how, if you're the Thessalonians and you're reading First and Second Thessalonians, how you would say, man, 90% of Paul's references to the coming of Christ, well, 99% of them are uh, 80, 70, something that's soon going to happen for us. But this one over here, this is the end of world history. It's just, you would have to have a, a future creedal bias to read First and Second Thessalonians that way. I just don't see that. Uh, being the case with the, the first century Christians reading this epistle. Yeah, I, again, I think that's an important point too. And talking to a, a friend the other day uh, about it's it's you've got to understand who the, what the audience is. Who who is who first got this, and what would they have thought about it? Uh, and would they have ever thought that there were these two different comings with all these parallels and 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 so forth? In fact. They wouldn't have the parallels that, that, that we have, if, if you think about it. Uh, they, they first, you know, Thessalonian letters, you, you, they got those. They would have had to interpret those things in terms of their own their own time. Paul, why would Paul have written that those letters to them about those things without giving any real indication that things are going to be divided between two separate two separate comings? You really you really don't you really don't see that at all. Yeah. Um, so. Not only that, but Reformed theology has typically said 2 Thessalonians 1, 5 through 10, with Christ coming in flaming fire there, is the end of the millennium coming of Revelation 20. So I, I think that's that's a whole nother can of worms that uh, Keith is going to have to deal with. But let's focus now on our, on our last guy. We have about, I don't know, four or five minutes, and I think we're, we're doing good on time. But this, Gary, struck me with such hypocrisy and the irony the philip kaiser signs this letter attacking you and everyone around him allowed him to sign it you simply said i'm still studying first thessalonians 4 i'm still studying first corinthians 15 i haven't made a conclusion yet and yet philip kaiser has made a conclusion that the parousia in first thessalonians 4 that brings about the resurrection and the parousia of 1 Corinthians 15, 23, which brings about the resurrection of 1 Corinthians 15, that was fulfilled in AD 70. Gary, somehow that's orthodox, but you just wanting to study these passages is a bridge too far? What am I missing? Well, th th this, is, this is a very important point because um, the only person who really contacted me to kind of help me out of this dilemma uh, was was Doug Wilson? Doug right. called me and he said um, he said, "Well, Gary, you know, you're you're studying it and that's okay, and uh, I understand all that. But why don't you just come right out and say I affirm these three points? Really, the first two. I I've never really discussed the third point about hell and the end of the world and what all that was going to be. But basically, the first the, the first two questions." Says, why don't you just say I affirm these, but I have these questions about these things, um, and I said I, I, I couldn't do it because I, first of all I, I just couldn't do it because it's not my my nature, and the second thing is my critics would have said, well, Gary, you're only saying that so you can get out of this this issue, yeah. this out of this problem. Yeah, it was but a no-win situation. I mean, so all one, all you had to do. All you had to do was say, I affirm the, the, the creedal and confessional statements about the second coming. And then you can do what, what Phil Kaiser and all the rest of these guys did. And they don't agree because you affirm the creedal and confessional statements. That, yeah. That's the way out of this. Yeah. You don't have to do real exe exegetical work to, to reconcile all these things. All you have to do is acknowledge what the creeds and the confession says. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow, so much. For we need soul. to do one. We need to do another one of these just on First Thessalonians four to look at all the little details of First Thessalonians four because I'd be interested to know your your perspective on that yeah. in particular. We can, yeah. I had a feeling we wouldn't be able to get into that, and we don't. We're we're at about fifty nine minutes, but I'll, I'll have you back and I'll give you my exegesis of First Thessalonians. Maybe 4. we can get Kim. Maybe we can do that. The three yeah. of us can do this. Oh, I'd love to do that. I can yeah, talk, maybe... talk him into it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. 
Yeah. So Kim says some things here uh, about, or not Kim, um, Philip says some things here about Matthew uh, 24 and 1 Thessalonians uh, 4.16. He, he clearly takes the parousia there as 80, 70. Some of this, to be honest with you, I don't understand. I believe he, he takes some kind of partial uh, rapture view, if I'm not mistaken. Is that is that true, Gary? I, I, I don't know. I haven't read a whole lot or listened to a lot of, of what Phil has done. Yeah, it's 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 rather confusing. I, I'd like to have him on uh, to either debate or to at least explain his position. Now, most of Reformed theology and full preterist, we all agree that the coming of Christ in 1 Thessalonians 4 is the same coming in 1, 1 Corinthians 15. The parallels there are just undeniable as well. But also, and, and maybe Kim and I and you can talk about this in the next episode, is all the parallels between Matthew 24 and 1 Corinthians 15. Um, those are very powerful. And we're looking at the analogy of faith. And again, the Reformed Study Bible tells us the parallels between Matthew 24 and 1 Corinthians 15 tell us that it's the same event. Well, again, if Matthew 24 was fulfilled in 8070, and it's the same event as 1 Corinthians 15, we have to break it down. The burden of proof is upon me, right? Because I'm, you know, I'm kind of going against the tide so I can show the parallels, but the burden of proof is upon me and Gary's correct. Can I produce an exegesis of 1 Corinthians 4? Can I produce an exegesis of 1 Corinthians 15 that will then harmonize all of this together? I I believe I can. I believe I have in the book, but in, in, uh, we can, we can go over that. But then, then you have the beautiful harmony between all three. At his parousia, at the trumpet, the living and the dead are gathered or caught or raised or changed into the kingdom, into God's presence. And I think that's probably a good way to kind of end it. And just to end it, I think Gary should be commended by just asking the questions and asking his friends to produce the exegetical work. Just don't condemn people to hell. Um, don't name call, don't censor like the liberals do. Um, don't stand, sit in your ivory tower and look down upon everyone else and and believe that you're above answering any exegetical questions. You know, let's talk, let's dialogue, let's at least try and answer these questions. As you know, we tried to have a documentary with Jenner, Gentry and, um, and Wilson, and that just fell through where, we had questions that we were going to ask them and they would they would respond and we would respond to their questions. And it wasn't a formal debate. It was just a, going to be a documentary. Right. But even that just is not acceptable to these people. Yeah, and that's that's OK. I, I prefer to write. That way I can be much more precise. I always hate I've tried that, too. I've said, let's have a written debate. Ken, you say you're not an oral debater. How many debate books have I mean, he's got like four views on the gifts four views on Revelation, four views on the millennium. The guy has done written debates. Come on. He did a full, he did a full book with Tommy Ice. On, I know, on the tribulation. On Matthew 24. And it's interesting, if you go back and read Ken on Matthew chapter 24, a lot of the arguments he used for his, for his preterist position, he has since changed because he sees that, that that particular position that he takes, especially on Matthew chapter 24, verse 27, He's, there, there are fewer and fewer passages that he is now referred to. So now we see him kind of going back and claiming some of those for yet a future second coming. And, you know, that to me, going back to Matthew 24, 27, is, that's, that was just an impossible, um, impossible faux pas because then you got to deal with Matthew 24, 34, mm-hmm. which is obviously 27 is before 34, and it just ruins his whole, his whole uh, hermeneutic at that point. But, you yeah, know, he, says, I can he, says, do about it. he says all these things. He doesn't say some of these things. Yeah, yeah. And, and, so, and anyway, it's, it's, it's interesting. Anyway. Well, thank you, Gary, so much for coming on. And I think that is a great idea. Um, let's reach out to Kim and see if he would be willing to come on. And we'll walk through First Thessalonians 4, and we'll look at all the challenges that, that the futurists and the reform guys have. And maybe we'll do a series on First Corinthians 15. I'm, I'm totally open to that. He and I, I know we're. I, he and I are working on doing something on First Corinthians fifteen. Oh, um, good. So he's he's pre- he's kind of preparing for that now. So we'll probably do something similar to what we did with the um, um, 
the, the hope of Israel and the nations two volumes. By the way, the second volume is out. So yes, so, so we're we're working on that. Hopefully, it won't be you know, twenty five of them like we did with the, with the other. So um, get get that book out as well. So all right, thanks, Mike. I appreciate it. Thank you, brother. Have a good one. Hey, thanks.